Welcome to week four of HI3284. This week we're looking at oral history and I wonder if some of the questions that we're going to be addressing surprise you. So we're looking at oral history, we're bringing in oral tradition and we're starting thinking about how recent oral history is. We'll then look at how historians engage with learning about the past by talking to people and we'll consider as well what distinguishes oral tradition from oral history. And underlying all this is a question of how as historians we do this, how do we do it with respect to our discipline and doing our discipline well, and how do we do it respectfully? How do we engage with oral tradition in particular respectfully? Now, the origins of oral history and the recentness of the origins of oral history may be a bit of a surprise to some of you. It might be a shock to realize just how recently oral history has become a tool used by reputable historians. The discipline or the subdiscipline emerged after the Second World War. Oral traditions are obviously older and can date back a whole lot longer. We'll get there. But it's worth noting that perhaps this isn't so much a shift in what historians do as a shift in how historians think about what they do. Before the 19th century, talking to people was doing historical research. There wasn't a discipline or a subdiscipline of oral history because everybody was doing oral history. So maybe oral history isn't quite the shift that I'm going to be presenting it as. Perhaps instead it's a slow reaction to the shift in the sanctification of the archive that occurred in the 19th century. And so how do we think about the archives? How do we think about the evidence that we use? Which is a theme underlying the subject and something you can keep in mind. Is it that oral history is new or are we treating it as new because of the way that we like to think about historical sources and the way that we like to keep them under control and store them somewhere? So here is a slide that really summarizes those ideas I've already introduced to you. And oral history is essentially that process of historians going and asking people about topics and recording them, recording their responses in full. It's not an interview where you go and you edit them and find excerpts. Oral history does require an interview and a full recording of that interview to be made. And it's something that perhaps you've done. At some point during my school days, we were required to go and talk to someone and record it as an interview. I talked to my father about his younger life, which was very interesting. And so I have done that little bit of oral history collecting. And I'm sure that many of you have done something similar. We're not going to actually collect oral history within the subject, though, because one of the things we will be discussing are ethical concerns around doing that and how do we make sure that we're doing it well and that we're respecting our sources appropriately. We will look at university ethics procedures and we'll get a sense of some of the demands that are placed on university researchers who wish to do oral history interviews. We're certainly not going through an entire ethics procedure for this subject but I hope that what you learn here will inform any subsequent oral history interviews you choose to conduct. One of the things that is very good about the ethics procedure, and that I'd like you to remember even when you don't go through it to talk to people, is that you are expected to provide some form of support for your interview subject. The basic standard is to make sure that they've got the phone number for Lifeline, and if you can provide anything more helpful than that, anything more directed to what you're asking them about, that's a good thing. And it seems pretty basic and perhaps a little bit insulting to make sure you provide that support. But when you start an oral history interview, you never know what your subject is going to talk about and how it will affect them. So you do need to offer some form of backup because you can't do that yourself all the time. Ethics also requires you to live up to the trust that your interview subject is placing in you, that you will treat their material appropriately. And this is something we'll return to in a moment. Part of that trust is not just using the information contained in the interview, it's also managing the record of that interview. 
And so part of the ethics procedure is getting your interview subject to sign and indicate in what ways they expect their interview to be stored and in what ways they're willing to make it accessible, either to you, the original researcher, or to subsequent researchers, if they're willing to be identified and to allow subsequent researchers access to that account. Before we plunge into the fraught ethics of oral history, we'll have a quick look at its own history. Modern oral history has its roots in the immediate aftermath of the Second World War. In part, this is because of changing technology. It's in that period that portable tape recorders become available. And so the technology is there to capture people talking to historians, really for the first time. Previously, recordings were made, but it required a degree of expense and expertise, which fades in this wake of the Second World War. And consider now the amazing recording equipment that most of us carry in the form of a mobile phone. Technology keeps on moving onwards. This ability to capture and create an archive is something you may wish to consider when you're doing research. The first organized oral history project took place at Columbia University in New York in 1948. And the people who were interviewed were members, male members of the social elite. This is the starting point of oral history, but oral history moves in quite different directions. Those people as male members of the elite already controlled the historical record. Oral history quickly moved to being a way to capture history from below, to try and capture the voices which aren't already in the archive, aren't already in the records, aren't already telling us about the past. So to capture different glimpses. And here it overlaps with studies of folklore. The collection of folklore has a mixed reputation. In England at this point, it wasn't seen as something that was good to do. Elsewhere though, because of the connections between folklore and nationalism, I remember my fraught relationship with nationalism. Folklore is associated with nationalism, and so in other parts of the world, it was a good national project to collect folklore from your region, and so it was respectable. This connection between oral history and folklore is reflected in the National Library of Australia's collection, which is of oral history and folklore. So that link remains because the origins of oral history are connected to that collection of folklore. That idea that oral history operates as a way of collecting views that aren't available in the paper archive is significant as a guiding principle for what happens. It explains the significance of feminist historians in the ethics discussions in your set reading. And oral history is seen as a way to capture the voices of women who are often excluded from the written archive. It explains too why there's a new burst of concern about oral history in the 1970s. It's in the 1970s that a whole lot of social issues bubble up and other voices get sought out. And you can see that here in the institutionalization of oral history. During the 1970s, more organizations start to emerge because oral history is seen as a way of collecting the experiences of these people who aren't well represented in the historical record. It's during this period too that oral history becomes problematized. Originally, it's seen as a straightforward archive. You can ask people, you can find out exactly what happens. As oral history practice matures, historians realize that these resources, these clearly primary resources, are not the porthole into the past that might be hoped. Oral histories are not straightforward evidence of what happened in the past, and oral historians have been grappling with that and continue to grapple with that. Oral history, in my opinion, cannot replace traditional sources, but as we've looked at already in this subject and will continue to see, traditional sources aren't crystal clear either. Oral historians work on this matter, as all historians work on considering what their sources are actually telling them. It's reasonably easy to identify the weaknesses of oral history. We don't all remember everything all the time. And sometimes we misremember. We are misled by hope and expectation about what might have happened. In addition, the collection of oral history is problematic. Talking to someone, depending on your relationship with them, you'll give them different aspects 
of your experiences. And oral historians spend a lot of time discussing their role as the interviewer and what parts of their subject's narratives they might have unwittingly obscured simply by their presence there. Beyond those errors in the record, beyond the misrepresentation or slant in the record because of the relationship between interviewer and interviewee, there's also the issue that Tim Rouse raised there in 1979, that oral history may not actually get you to the important stuff, that the large forces in people's lives may not be something that they're particularly aware of or that they've put into words. Many of these problems, though, are problems with all historical sources. All sources are biased, and it's something that historians have become more and more aware of. And while oral stories may be unreliable, many of our sources are oral at base. I've already mentioned that question of whether we can consider newspaper reports as primary sources, considering that the reporter generally wasn't at the scene of the incident and has instead talked to people. Talking to people and knowledge embodied in people is very important in human life. If you think of court proceedings, what's presented there is embodied knowledge, knowledge in people. And when we write, that's also what we're presenting in many ways, knowledge embodied in people. So while oral sources are problematic, all sources are problematic, and that's not enough reason to write them all off. Instead, there is a burgeoning school of oral history and oral history criticism. All sorts of tools are being created and debated in terms of how oral history can be used and managed. Talking about the oral history that emerges in the wake of the Second World War, we're mostly talking about people remembering their own lives, discussing things that have been important to them. There's also the matter of oral tradition, so back more into what might be considered more folklore, but in Australia that's probably not an appropriate thing to say. It's a recognition that there are cultural memories, there are cultural stories that reach back a long way, and that historians are now coming to consider and to try and work out how they can handle them with respect and with enough care to extract meaning from them. Some of the same ethical problems arise as with oral history. And again, that relationship between interviewer and interviewee, between storyteller and listener, is problematic. As historians, we tend to be analytical. We want to ask questions. We want to query our sources. As interviewers and as listeners, those tendencies might not be appropriate. They might not be appropriate in part because they may cause our sources to clam up. They might not be appropriate because they don't show enough respect for the knowledge that is being passed to us. And the collection of oral tradition is at least as dependent on the relationship between the storyteller and the listener as the collection of oral history is on the relationship between the interviewer and the interviewee. As historians, despite the difficulties with dealing with oral history and oral tradition, we can't ignore them. It's very comforting to dive into a written archive and to think that the answers lie there, pinned to paper without having to deal with messy people. As a profession, though, oral history and oral tradition is important. Oral tradition has uses in native title claims. It has uses for people's own lives in terms of cultural belonging. It's important for family history, which is something that historians are branching out into. It's used in claims to rights and to ownership. Those significant aspects of oral history lie beyond the borders of history. Oral traditions are used by lawyers, by cultural actors, by families, by activists. As historians, we don't have a monopoly on them. And just as with oral history sources, we have problems about how we should be treating them in order to show appropriate respect. There are risks of cultural appropriation by historians, by other actors, if we don't acknowledge ownership of oral traditions and respect that. So again, some of this lies beyond the borders of historical practice. And this question of what uses can be respectfully made of oral tradition by people 
who fall outside the group that they strictly belong to is something that's going to be contested for a while in settler societies. We can see it playing out in responses to artwork. There's a link there to an article about the 1997 theft of paintings by Colin McCann. Colin McCann produced what are seen as very important New Zealand paintings, but he is Pākehā and used imagery that comes from Māori iconography. As a result, a particular painting, the Uruwera Triptych, was stolen by members of Tūhoi, although it was returned after about a year on the run. Similarly, in Australia, there are concerns about the use of Aboriginal design elements on souvenirs and in contexts that aren't controlled by their traditional owners. There have been concerns about fake boomerangs and cheap souvenirs that misuse significant cultural elements. And again, there's a link in case you wish to consider that more fully. But to bring us back to the matter of oral history, these things are important. Western history tends to be text-based. I've mentioned in this lecture the idea that historians tend to sanctify or reify archives. We like collections of documents. We think these collections are significant and we think that our past lies within them. Oral history hints that that's simply not sufficient, that we need to recognize different types of history and different ways of accessing knowledge about the past. Questions about what historians should be doing and what sources need to be consulted to do it well really started to be raised in the 1970s. And at that point, two questions are raised about whether historians can ever be truly objective or whether we need to recognize the value of other subjectivities when dealing with fluid histories that are created in an oral tradition. At around that time too, there's the question of what these different archives might yield in terms of perspectives and conclusions, because they tend to come from different places, particularly, as I say, from groups that are not acknowledged. I've mentioned women, the working class, but also significantly indigenous perspectives. So those people that get left out of the written archive, this is the great promise of oral history, but it's also the great challenge. Because if it's not written evidence, if it shifts, if it's so dependent on the context in which it is collected, how do we use it? Can we consider it actually as evidence of the past? And how much should we allow it to influence our interpretation? The use of oral tradition heightens those concerns. How should this evidence be used? Should we not use it at all for fear of appropriation or disrespect? How do we evaluate it? Again, can we be critical historians when we're dealing with stories that are, in some cases, sacred? Do we use these oral histories and oral traditions as evidence? Do we associate them with events? Or do we treat them simply as a means of examining relationships? Oral history, the use of oral tradition, is fraught. I've told you that historians are contentious. This is the perfect ground for us to exercise all our powers of contention. We can dispute the value of the evidence. We can dispute the use of the evidence. We can dispute whether it is appropriate to use the evidence. There are a whole lot of questions, and I'm not going to provide you with answers. Instead, we're going to meet in tutorial, and we're going to find out what you think on these matters.